Most chronic diseases only become symptomatic once a certain threshold of inflammation or level of tissue damage has occurred. At this stage though, the disease may be irreversible with no possibility of cure. Now recently, the idea of early preemptive diagnosis has evolved. So for example, pre-diabetes has led to the identification of likely future diabetics and early intervention. The pre-diagnostic phase of Alzheimer's and Parkinson's are also being explored. So what about asthma? Can pre-asthma be diagnosed? And if so, can it lead to the prevention of real asthma in predisposed individuals? This is Euphoria News, broadcasting from London. Hello and welcome to Euphoria News. I'm Dr. David Bull. Asthma is a highly prevalent disease affecting between three and 400 million people worldwide. For many, it's a chronic lifelong disease which has profound implications on people's quality of life. But for others, it can be fatal. The burden of treating asthma is significant. It requires daily therapy, constant monitoring, and a myriad of medication, including inhalers, oral corticosteroids, and in some patients, monoclonal antibodies. But these are extremely expensive, and not all countries have authorized their use. Now, there are many risk factors for asthma which are universally recognized, but there is no routine screening program for asthma in at-risk individuals. So if we look at other conditions that have defined pre-states, is there a state of pre-asthma where we can intervene to stop full-blown asthma from developing? It's an intriguing question indeed. Well, to explore this fascinating quandary, I'm delighted to be joined by Professor Glenis Scadding. She is a Euphoria board member and the Euphoria Rhinitis Expert Panel Chair. She's also Honorary Associate Professor in the Department of Infection and Immunity at University College in London and also author of a recent publication on pre-asthma by Euphoria. Really good to see you, uh, Professor Scadding. I I'm really intrigued by this because I think all of us as clinicians are really familiar with asthma and obviously it makes up a huge bulk of work for primary care physicians. We all know those cardinal signs though, but I have never ever considered the idea of pre-asthma. How has that come about? It occurred to me, David, whilst at a Euphoria Asthma meeting. We had a, a meeting on asthma in London last year and we're talking about it. And as someone who knows about rhinitis, particularly allergic rhinitis, and the fact that that is a risk factor for asthma, it occurred to me that perhaps we were missing a trick by looking, by not looking harder at asthma prevention. Prevention is obviously better than cure. And then I began to look at what would be necessary and what the possibilities of exploring pre-asthma were. And we got a team of people together to put this paper together. And in it, we uh, start off by acknowledging, as you have just read from it, that asthma is a terrific burden to individuals and society and sometimes kills people. And it would be wonderful if we could decrease the prevalence of it simply by 10% by being clever about identifying its possibilities early. So really, this is your eureka <laughs> moment in many ways, isn't it? Um, how, how then would you define pre-asthma then? Now, that's a good question. And the honest answer is we don't yet know. What we've done is to look at all the risk factors for asthma. And these, of course, are both genetic and environmental. And then we tried to put together the idea that perhaps people with no risk factors will be level zero, with one, perhaps a family history will be level one, and then family history and a known predisposing disease, such as allergic rhinitis, atopic dermatitis, food allergy, will be the next level. And then the fourth level will be those people who are getting intermittent inflammation in their lower airways, not yet full-blown asthma 
but airway inflammation is happening. And one way to measure that, of course, is by exhaled nitric oxide. And so we're suggesting that perhaps we should be looking at that more. We should be going back to the cohort studies that have been done to see if we can learn more from them about who progresses to asthma, to the immunotherapy studies similarly, because of course not everyone with allergic rhinitis gets asthma. And we're trying to find out who goes on to get asthma. What are those determining factors? And can we do something to intervene? So, so also then what comes to mind is genetically, I suppose we should be able to tell those people who are at risk of pre-asthma. Well, genetically, yes, there are several different genes involved. Some of those are genes relating to allergy and atopy. Some of them relate <clears throat> to the epithelium. Filagrin, for example, the substance that holds epithelials together, uh, cells together, if you have genes with poor filagrin, then you are more likely to get atopic dermatitis and asthma. Um, also, genes relating to the way in which immunity and infection happen, the way in which infections are dealt with, seem to be uh, very relevant in smaller children with asthma and genes that um, involve processing of antigens. So there are several different sets of genes involved. But of course, we don't look at genes in everybody, do we? Not everyone <laughs> does one, two, three, and me. So we actually need a kind of uh, test which is easier to do. And it may be a combination. It may be a combination of history, you know, family history, personal history of rhinitis, and then a test, perhaps phenome. What we need to do is to explore what's out there and to plan future trials, looking to see if we can spot the warning signs in those trials. And then, if we do something, what does it do? And that something might be allergen-specific immunotherapy, for allergic rhinitis. It might be giving a monoclonal a dupilumab for atopic dermatitis appears to reduce the subsequent incidence of allergy. Or it might be doing something about food allergy. And we know now that there's no point in avoiding food antigens in pregnancy, but that early weaning onto things like peanuts and milk and eggs is a good idea, not a bad one. And we need to get that idea out there. And that might well be able to reduce the prevalence of asthma because egg allergy is a very good predictor of future asthma. So there are quite a lot of different things that we ought to be looking at and thinking of doing. And one of them is to get this idea to the people who see allergic rhinitis. And that's not asthma specialists. That's pharmacists, GPs, pediatricians, ENTs. So we need to get the idea that some of their patients may go on to get asthma, and it might be worthwhile identifying them and recommending specific treatment in future. I, I really enjoyed reading this paper, actually, I have to say. And, and one of the things that caught my eye in it is this link, as you mentioned just there, between predisposition and environment about the farms, raw milk, for example. Yes, yes. That, that is absolutely fascinating, that data. In, initial studies came from Austrian farms where people lived in houses with their cattle in a separate part of the house. They had very intimate contact. And the small babies were taken into the cattle sheds with mum milking the cow and the baby there among the straw and the cattle poo and everything else. And that data has also been uh, added to by studies from places like Finland and Russia. After the last war, there was a huge difference in de development between Finland and the adjoining part of Karelian Russia, where Finland went very westernized and developed, 
and the Russian side remain very pastoral and agricultural. And the difference in allergies is tremendous with far more on the Finnish side. And the difference in the gut microbiome is also tremendous with a great deal more diversity on the Russian side and some differences in, in the bacteria involved. But it looks as though early contact with dirt and getting a good diverse microbiome is really important. And one of the easy ways to do that in the UK is to have a dog present in the house during the first year of life, because dogs bring in all sorts of dirt. The data on cats is a lot more uh, diverse. And that's absolutely extraordinary, I have to say. Uh, so get a dog is, is the answer here. So just to clarify here, so the idea with this is you're going to basically tabulate people into, into those, those risk factors uh, and then intervene there. Uh, this idea of, of pre-asthma, I think, is really, really interesting. As you say, you came up with the idea. Is the concept now gaining importance? Are you getting buy-in from other clinicians? As yet, not much. But I think it will build. I think we have to promote this idea. We need to get um, people to think about the possibility that they might get asthma and what can they do about it as well. We need to promote it not only to the medical fraternity, but also to the public, who I think could be doing a great deal more in their own lives to help with not developing allergies and asthma and particularly in their children's lives. Now, we all know that uh, healthcare services around the world are absolutely stretched to the max in, in almost every country. When we look at the cost implications of this, uh, this is why I think it's so important. If we look at the numbers of children in this country who are treated for asthma, say, say it's about a million kids who are being treated, the cost is absolutely off the scale. It's about a billion pounds a year, isn't it? And it's not going to go away. They're very a, a small proportion of children lose their asthma actually and tend to develop it again later in their 40s, quite interestingly. But the majority don't. The majority will keep their asthma for the rest of their lives. So it's an ongoing burden on the taxpayer, on the NHS, on the taxpayer. And the more we can do to chop that off before it starts, the better. So, so just to, to summarise where we are, you've now uh, got these categories of people, you've classified them, those people who are most likely to develop into full-blown asthma. I assume at that point you decide whether you intervene early or not with, with the steps that you mentioned earlier. Yes. And I think there will be different sets of individuals with asthma coming from different mechanisms. There'll be people with AD who are getting sensitized via the skin. There'll be people with allergic rhinitis who are having sensitization, which is probably spreading from the upper to the lower airway. So we need to alert different clinician sets to this. We need to do some really good prospective studies looking in detail at what is happening to patients. And I would like to see more allergen-specific immunotherapy studies for allergic rhinitis, trying to work out if we are preventing asthma, who are we preventing it in, so that we can actually focus the use of that treatment much better. And it's a much easier treatment these days with sublingual immunotherapy under the tab under the tongue tablets rather than having to have injections. So it, it is cost effective therapy for rhinitis, but also might well prevent asthma. We need to do more of it. We need to examine the studies previously done very closely, and we need to do very focused studies in future. Yeah, and I'm assuming that sublingual immunotherapy also Im improves compliance as well. So, so let me put you on the spot, if I may, uh, Professor Scanning. What, what for you, this, is, th this paper is a great start. It's a great start. What does success look like for you? Success looks like getting asthma reduced by 10% or more in future years. Say, say it'll be down the line, say five years down the line, asthma prevalence is declining in countries which have adopted a pre-asthma strategy. 
Well, if you do that, that will be quite a something. Thank you very much indeed to Professor Glenis Scadding. Thank you, David. So there you have it. Really fascinating stuff and food for thought. Thank you very much indeed to Professor Glenis Scadding. And that's it for this Euphoria News Show. Now you can find more information about Euphoria and also register for the Euphoria educational events on the euphoria.eu website where you can also sign up to receive the latest news via email. And don't forget to follow us on social media on YouTube, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram and of course Facebook. Until next time, goodbye.